morning. Welcome. Uh, it is clearly those days of summer. Um, we're going to just begin the welcome as people continue to uh, stream in. And I will tell you, it just brings me great joy to see all of your faces. And I, I feel today especially blessed um, to be here part of your congregation. Um, it would be just uh, three years ago next week uh, that I did my candidating um, service. Uh, so I think that's why I'm, I'm feeling all the feels right now. Friends, welcome. Welcome to Williston Emmanuel United Church, where we believe in acceptance without conditions, affirmations without discrimination, which is why we remind one another that no matter who you are, no matter whom you love or your chosen pronoun, no matter the color of your skin or your immigration status, no matter the amount of money or education that you have, no matter your affiliation, your affliction, or the mistakes that you have made in your life, you are welcome here, wherever you are on life's journey. If you are visiting with us today, welcome. We hope that you'll stay around. We will have a time of gathering afterwards for visiting with one another. You are more than welcome to stick around. If you are visiting with us online, please know that you can find our bulletin at wiuc.org. That's our website, and you'll be able to find the bulletin there if you'd like to follow along, and especially if you'd like to sing along with us wherever you are today. Uh, you'll want to go there and uh, grab that bulletin off um, off the end. Welcome. Good morning. Um, so, as we continue to just kind of gather ourselves here in this place, let's sing together our new gathering of songs, We Are Called. And none of us probably know it, we might. If you do know it, especially sing out. But we're just going to um, have it played through maybe one time. One time. Hello, oh, sir. Good morning. Um, and then we'll sing it. Thank you. It may be that I needed to start all over again. <laughs> Apparently the lapel mic does not work when it's attached to your pocket. Fun fact. Should I start all over again? We have time. Welcome. You are loved. You are welcome here. I'm so glad to see you. This is Williston Emanuel United Church. If you are online, uh, please go to our website at wiuc.org for the bulletin. All right, with that. Our, um, our theme today really is um, part of a larger theme, which is called in. So we are called. We are called into our faith. And so we're going to look at things like being called to connection, being called to humility, being called to transformation and belonging. But today we're going to start out with something a little bit harder which is called to repentance. 
And so as we kind of even begin shifting a little bit in our seats, perhaps feeling a little bit uncomfortable, possibly, I want you to consider these words uh, by Bruce Wilkinson. Repentance means you change your mind so deeply that it changes you. Again, repentance means you change your mind so deeply that it changes you. I want for you to think about these words as we listen to the beautiful um, music this morning, ponder them, or if anything, just breathe. morning. Friends, scripture is full of the stories of people long ago in another world. They are people who did not always live righteous lives and who made selfish choices. And as we hear one of these stories this morning, we ask that God gives us ears to listen, eyes to see, hearts to accept that their stories are often our stories as well. Please join me in prayer. Lord, as we enter worship today, May we have the ears to hear, the eyes to see, and hearts to accept that we are not perfect and have made mistakes in our own lives. Remind us that we are called to rend our hearts, not our garments. Help us to return to you, God. We give you thanks that you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love. Amen. Let us now join together in our opening hymn, Just As I Am. The lyrics can be found in the bulletin, which is available on our website at wiuc.org.
difícil. So this is Pride Month, and we decided as a congregation that we would go big. And hopefully it feels like we have gone big so far with everything on the calendar and all that we're planning to do. Part of that going big was really to invite people in our congregation uh, to share their pride story, their pride moment, and to really um, maybe connect it with um, this particular faith community. And with that, I invite Leo forward. Leo just became a member of our church, Leo Dean, um, and he said yes to being one of our speakers. Thank you, Leo. I don't normally like do stuff like this, so anyway, all right. Uh, for those who don't know me, um, I'm Leo, and I am a transgender man. Um, yeah, pride is a time of joy and celebration, um, of being proud of who we are and uh, how we got here. But it's also a reminder of the work that has to be done. Um, the way the world treats us uh, during the other 11 months of the year definitely needs work. Um, so yeah, I spent a lot of time in debate about what, what I was gonna talk about. Um, so I decided to really just share my truth. Um, June is an extremely hard month for me. Um, when all is said and done, I, uh, the truth is I'm not really that proud of myself or my identity. Um, it's incredible seeing all of the queer people in my life celebrate who they are and be happy with who they are. Uh, and I want more than anything for every member of our community to feel that way. But I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel jealousy. I want to feel proud. I want to love this fundamental part of myself. But um, the initial euphoria of coming out, finally feeling comfortable in the gender I am, finally feeling free, it kind of wore off. Um, I'm tired. Being transgender has made my life significantly harder than it would be if I wasn't. Safe housing, ridicule and attacks on character based on my identity, strained relationships with family and friends and relationships that became non-existent. Um, it was, uh, in the church I grew up in, it was preached that God only loves you if you act exactly as you're told and if you think exactly as you're told. You have to earn his love. You're not simply given it. As a kid who knew, even without the words for it, that I wasn't a girl, that I would never fit into that small group of people who were considered worthy, I gave up on the idea of God loving me. I pushed all ideas of spirituality away. Then, a good friend and a leap of faith brought me to Williston Emanuel. God appeared in my life when I needed him most, and I couldn't even see that until later. I came into this church and I found my family. I saw people of all walks of life. The people here met me right where I was at. I was offered love without conditions, even when I wasn't fully ready to accept God into my life. I was helped to gradually build a connection with my God and your God, who loves me exactly as I am. The people here truly did take my hand and put it in the hand of God. Walking into a church without being drowned in anxiety and guilt is a win in itself. But knowing I'm home, knowing the people here love me for me is a gift. I may not be proud right now, but there are people here who are proud for me, and that's more than I could ever ask for. So thank you. Thank you, Leah. This is indeed a place of welcome, and it is a place of celebration. And we want to um, not only be excited about pride, but excited about our graduates, a different kind of um, transition that's happening in their lives. And so we're taking that time. We've not taken it. I think the pandemic hit, and a lot of traditions went to the wayside. So I'm so grateful, um, Gracie, that you said, hey, <laughs> we've got some graduates. 
As you see in your bulletin, we're celebrating uh, Ben Cobb, who's graduating from Thornton Academy in Saco, where he is this year's valedictorian. Uh, ben plans to attend UMaine and major in engineering. We're also celebrating, um, and these two gentlemen couldn't be here today, we're, we're also celebrating Thomas Costin, who graduated from Bates College with a double major in math and economics, and plans to work in Boston as an investment banking an, 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 analyst. analyst. Um, hold on a second here. <laughs> uh, we're also celebrating Isa Gomez. Would you come forward, Isa? Isa is graduating from Casco Bay High School and plans to attend Clark University in the fall. That's good. All right, we also have Bonnie. Yay, Bonnie Johnson is graduating from South Portland High School. Bonnie plans to attend Spa Tech in Westbrook to become a licensed esthetician. Oh, mercy. I'm sorry. <laughs> but she's going to do an amazing job. So if you need help in the future, come see Bonnie. This is for you. And you, you may not have realized it that in all of the things that he does, um, Matt was also earning a degree. And Matt, I'd like you to come forward as well. He's graduating from USM with a bachelor's of science in leadership and organizational studies with a GPA of 4.0. Let's do another round, if you would. Lovely. Um, so much excitement. I don't know if you were here last week, but we had so much to celebrate last week, and the, the joy and the celebration continues. Um, and I didn't grab my box sooner. Is there anyone who might like to help me with the box today? Any, anyone. Lucas, do you want to help me? No, okay. You're passing. That's like a no thank you. All right, well, that's all right. I can do this. All right, so um, we have a few phrases in here, and I, and I, I just want to get your opinion on some of these here. The first one, just kind of I want to know how you feel about this. If you're online, uh, you can put in the chat box how these words make you feel. I don't know if anyone can read those. I was wrong. It's the opposite of I was right. I was wrong. Anyone enjoy saying this particular one? Yeah, right. Boo. <laughs> These only get better, by the way. All right. I'm sorry. When we say I'm wrong, this is usually the next best step is to say I'm, I'm sorry, I'm truly sorry. Yeah. And then, forgive me. Please forgive me. These are not easy steps. I don't know if any of you have tried any of these. Um, uh, they're, they're humbling. It takes a lot of awareness to realize that we've messed up, that we have somehow hurt someone. It takes a lot of humility to say I'm sorry and to forgive me. And then what's the missing? There's one final step. So you've acknowledged you're wrong. You've said you're sorry. You've said please forgive me. Don't do it again. That's also not easy. Uh, sometimes we're wired to do certain things, and I, uh, I know if my husband was here, he'd go, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but that's what we're talking about today, this exciting thing called repentance, which is really saying, I messed up, I was wrong, I'm sorry, and I'm going to do different. So with that, let's hear about a man in the Bible who um, was kind of called out. He hadn't quite realized that he had done some, some bad stuff, or at least had not admitted it. And um, 
Kyle's here to share that story. Today's scripture, Today's scripture reading comes from 2 Samuel uh, 11, 26 to 12, 15 from the Common English Bible. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought into his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over, because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are that man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house to you, and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by, going, by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all of Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. Before we uh, review this story of repentance, I want to plant a few seeds. I want for you to begin thinking about these questions, and we'll touch on them as we we go through the, the message this morning. I want for you to first consider who has been a truth teller in your life? Who has been your Nathan? Who's called you out? How can you be that truth teller to yourself? Sometimes it's a matter of getting our own self-awareness, so how can you be your own truth teller? And why does repentance matter? David had abused his power. He was at the peak of his political career. He had everything he could possibly want. He had streak after streak after streak of successful war campaigns. He had many wives. He had many mistresses. He was actually kind of a generous guy, but he was also greedy. He was filled with desire, you see. He saw a woman, the wife of one of his very loyal, very mighty warriors, Uriah. He saw her doing a ritual cleansing, one that would be expected that a woman should do after her monthly cycle. He sees her bathing and sends for her. If Bathsheba lived today, she would have a hashtag me too. For when the king sends for you, when that person in power sends for you and requests certain things of you, you don't really have much say in that. There isn't much consent. 
And when David learned that he had successfully um, caused a baby to be formed in her womb, he decided he'd cover it up. So he sends for Uriah. He says, oh my gosh, you are such an amazing soldier. I really would like to put you on furlough, you know, give you some time with your wife. And this has probably been done for centuries, hasn't it? Uriah was such a good soldier that he could not bear to see his wife or spend any kind of intimate time with her because his fellow soldiers were fighting. Even after King David got him drunk, he still wouldn't do it. So King David went to the next step. He decided he would have to figure out how to eliminate Uriah, which is what he did on the battlefield. Because of his selfish actions, Bathsheba was sexually assaulted, was once just an only wife and became one of many. Maybe that was a benefit, but maybe it put her at the bottom of the pecking order. She had two significant deaths in less than a year, her husband Uriah and an infant son. It is a tragic story of multiple wrongs. And it's kind of easy perhaps to see how David would be reluctant to, to really admit that he had done wrong. Very few of us, after all, eagerly admit to wrongdoings. Sometimes we're blind to them. We, we don't even realize that we have harmed someone or uh, injured them perhaps in some way. Sometimes it's denial. We kind of suspect it, but we don't want to think about it. We could be indifferent. I don't really care about that person. What, what do I care if, if their feelings were hurt? They're a terrible person anyway. Or we might be like David, self-righteous or, or conceited. He was the king. He could have whatever he wanted. So God sent the trusted prophet Nathan and tasked him with calling David out to expose him to the truth of his harmful decisions. He had taken Bathsheba and murdered her husband to cover up that first transgression. Nathan is a genius. He uses a parable, maybe to soften the king, catch him off guard, which worked, didn't it? David assumed that there was someone who had done this terrible, terrible thing, which in the end was him. Now that brings us to that first question. Nathan was David's truth teller. And I want to know who has been your truth teller. If you're online, it could be something you might want to put in the comment section. You might. Who has that person been? Was it a parent? Your spouse? A teacher or an elder who said, I don't know if that was the right thing you should have done. Maybe it was a stranger. Sometimes God blesses us with strangers that come into our lives and call us out. Sometimes it's the actions of another person. I read a story of a woman who was in recovery for her alcoholism, and she was hearing a story of someone who had been driving drunk, a, a long-haul truck driver driving drunk. And initially she was just appalled that this man would drink and drive. And then she took a little time to reflect on that and realized what? She had done the same thing. Now, for someone like her, it did take some self-reflection on her part, some awareness to realize that she could be her own truth teller. And we can, when no one else is around. It is possible for us to become self-aware of our wrongdoings. But we have to develop a capacity for self-examination and, and self-awareness to be that personal truth teller. Which leads to the second question, how do we become self-aware? I think one of the first steps is through prayer, that we ask for that kind of insight from God. Psalm, 31, uh, Psalm 139 actually talks about at the very end, the psalmist is asking God, um, you know, God, search me. Go ahead, test me. You know, see if everything is right in my heart. 
And really, that's what we should pray for. We should pray to God to say, God, I want you to show me how to search myself, how to know my own heart, how to test my own thoughts, how to see in myself if there is any wicked way within. I was thinking of the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, we ask, forgive us our debts, or some churches say our transgressions, trespasses, our sins. Forgive us as we forgive others. Well, maybe we should first say, Lord, please give us the ability to see what we have done, and then forgive us as we forgive others. We can listen to our bodies. We can scan our bodies. And if you've never done that, you kind of start from the top and you think about, does my head hurt right now? How does my throat feel? My shoulders, my chest, you work your way down. Especially if we've had an interaction with someone that maybe didn't go over so well. We had a conversation that kind of blew up in our face or we did something and we're just wanting to check. You might feel tenseness in your, in your throat or, or pain chest, chest, chest pain, pain in your chest. Maybe you have a stomach ache. These are opportunities to examine what might also be going on for you. The body does speak, and it might be telling you it's time to think, what is it maybe that I have done that was wrong? I think we can also put ourselves in each other's shoes. So if I snap at a clerk, you know, I've been waiting in line and I snap at the clerk because I'm just sick and tired and tired of being sick and tired, and I snap at that person, I might take the opportunity to see what's going on on her side of it. You know, are there so many clothing, piles of clothing behind her? It really shows that it's been a busy day. Maybe it wasn't busy while I was there, but maybe there's clues around me that show that she's been having a hard day. And then I realize I'm the one that messed up. And finally, when it comes to how can we be self-aware, we need to make it a habit, a habit of rooting out and IDing the things that we have done that are not right. Within the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and the reason I think all of us should live by the 12 steps, is that they work into the 12 steps the need to write a list. Write a list of the people you have harmed and then make amends. What was the action or inaction that you did that impacted or harmed another person or sometimes that has harmed you? That brings us to the third question. Why? Why would you want to admit that you'd done anything wrong? Well, because transgressions wrongdoings in many ways means that we have been separated from God and from one another. In the letter known as 1 John, it says, if we don't love our brother, we don't love God. It's that simple, which really connects us to Jesus's commandment to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. It's all about the love. Nathan didn't just call David out, getting him to admit his transgression, but he called him in, back into relationship, right relationship with God. Repentance is just that. It's, it's not an, only an invitation to acknowledge a sin, but to turn back to God and to change your ways. David did that. In 1 Kings, so it comes after the book that we just read, 2 Samuel comes 1 King, and we read during the reign of Solomon, Bathsheba's son, that David lived a righteous life. He did everything right in God's eyes, except for that time with Uriah. So his whole life, he did miss the mark with Uriah greatly, but from then on, it sounds as though he continued to do right. And I think that he attempted to make amends, as we would say in the 21st century, with Bathsheba. When that child of theirs died, he went and showed her comfort. There's no record of him doing that when her husband died. But he went and showed her comfort. 
Instead of non-consensual sex, it says he went and made love to her. That's very different. And on his own deathbed, he honors his promise to her that her son would be king, which also secured her own future. Friends, I invite you this week to think about how you are called to repentance. What transgression or wrongdoing have you been a part of? What amends needs to be made? To whom do you need to apologize and make things right? Now, that's not always easy. I know this. I know this. But sometimes it can just happen in the moment. I had a woman come up to me at a a retreat we were both working on, and she kind of, it seemed out of the blue to me, said, do I owe you an apology? I said, for what? And she said, "I, I, I came to talk to you just a moment ago, and you were very angry with me. She thought maybe earlier in the weekend that she had somehow offended me. In this case, she was my truth teller, that I had snapped unknowingly. So we can do it in the moment. We can just check it out, see if we need to offer an apology. But in some of our lives and in some of the cases and the things that we've done, it takes a lot longer. Some of the amends we make are much harder to do. Why? Because perhaps neglect was involved or abuse maybe infidelity or, or deceit or maybe just shaming someone else. These are not always easy to admit and not always easy to ask forgiveness for. But we must consider what we can do to make things right. We need to admit to that person our wrongdoings, ask forgiveness, change our behaviors, and try to earn trust. We are called, after all, to imitate God, to imitate Jesus, loving and forgiving as they are. We are called as Christians to do, um, we are called as Christians to be a new creation, right? We're called to leave all the old stuff behind. This is an ongoing process. But that's what it means to be a Christian. Always moving into that new creation. And the question would be, is it worth it? And my answer would be, absolutely. Amen. And so may it be. of the people. Mm-hmm. So, you know, nothing like having a different uh, script than the old uh, bulletin there. Uh, how about some prayer? <laughs> Looks like maybe we're doing prayer right now. All right. <laughs> Friends, I invite you just to take a nice deep breath. Um, I'm going to offer a pastoral prayer, lift up some um, general prayers, and, and then you'll be invited into a time of silence just to lift up your own prayers. And it may be your time just to say, Lord, show me, show me how I can do this. Show me how I can scan my body, look at my heart. Um, help me, help me to see my wrongdoings. Let's pray. Most holy God, we uh, might come kicking and screaming into this process. It is so not easy to admit we were wrong. It's so easy to say, yes, but. I did this, but there was good reasons. I did this, but I, I, um, I was in the right, not in the wrong. Lord, help us to really, truly look at our lives And understand that, yes, perhaps indeed, we have caused harm to another. Perhaps, yes, indeed, we have caused harm even to ourselves. And 
Give us the courage to do what is right, to pray, to acknowledge our wrongdoings, and to ask for forgiveness. And indeed, it's so easy to look upon this world and consider ourselves so right. Oh, we see so much brokenness in the world. Help us to be compassionate. Help us to be compassionate when we hear about people that might have been planning an attack on a pride parade in Idaho. Be with us as we try to talk with family and friends about political things that we disagree on. Help us to find ways to talk with each other, not at each other. Help us to trust in you that you are moving in this world, that you are somehow making your peace known in places that seem so absent of it. We continue to pray for the people of Ukraine and the people of so many war-torn nations. May those places not only experience your peace, but help it to shine in other places of the world as well. We ask your blessings upon the pride parade that is coming up. We pray that there are people who just never knew that communities could be so welcoming. We ask that you bless people who are working at coming out, who are working at feeling proud of who they are. May your hand be upon them and bless them and help them to find community. We thank you for graduates, for all, whether it's kindergarten or uh, a doctoral student and everyone in between, those here in our church today and those a part of our church family, blessings upon blessings as they move into the next stage of life. May you just continue to be their guide and their presence in all that they do. Be with us, Lord, each and every day. Keep our eyes and our hearts open to your presence wherever you may be. Be with us in this moment as we spend this time in silence for our own personal prayers. We give you thanks, Lord, for all the ways you hear and answer our prayers. And we ask that you hear this prayer that we share together, spoken so many, many years ago by Jesus, praying, Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. community. Let us now share our gifts and resources so that we may continue to walk humbly with God and with neighbors. If you are participating in worship online or prefer electronic giving, you are welcome to visit our website, wiuc.org, to donate. Look for the Support Our Ministry button. Thank you for your generosity. We will now receive the offering. Thank you. 
join me in prayer. Lord, we dedicate these gifts that have been shared for the fortification of the beloved community. Let these gifts do justice in the world. Let them be a sign of our belief in the God who saves, heals, unites, and sets free. Let these gifts and the work of our hands and feet be a blessing to all in need. Amen. Now we'll sing our final hymn, Dear God, Embracing Humankind.
beginning to, uh, anyway, you know what I mean. Um, Soul Food, if you would like to join us, uh, come at 1145 online. Um, I do stay here, so if you want to join me here, otherwise you can head home and go to our website and just sign right on to the, um, it's fellowship and um, soul food. So if you want to come online, join us. We're going to talk about repentance. Who doesn't want to be there? I look forward to seeing you. Um, John, I'd like to invite you forward to talk about pride. It's package plan, you get John, you get me. Uh, <laughs> as uh, all of you are certainly aware by now, this is Pride Week. And uh, this coming Saturday is the uh, Pride and the Festival. Uh, for those of you that don't know us, which I'm sure it's not that many of you, but my name is Keith, this is John, my partner. He is our fearless uh, parade organizer and Woo. he's He's here to tell you more about the parade as well as the festival, so take it away. Thank you. First thing I want to tell you is, usually I have a nervous nature, so weather, no. weather is my priority for pride. And I'm watching the eight-day forecast, and finally it came out that Saturday is going to be sunny in the 70s. Yay. Good day for marching. Um, by show of hands, I want to be able to go over the three different categories we have for participating in this event. One is the water station that we'll have outside the church to greet um, marchers and, and visitors. If anybody can raise your hand if you're interested in doing that. There's three or four people. The next thing is a pride table at the festival, which is a first for us for a lot of years. Um, we need to have people to man the table, talk to pride goers or whatever, and um, show of hands for anybody do, wanting to do that. I've got a sign-up sheet there too. <clears throat> and of course, most important, the pride parade. Anybody wanting to join us in the, the march down Congress Street, down High Street, to Deering Oaks that day. Great. Um, I've got a couple of details to mention. Michael Reba's husband is, has volunteered to go down to the festival area, set up our table and chairs. He'd like another volunteer to go with him. If, if anybody wants to do that, contact Reba or Kate in the office. <clears throat> Our car is provided by Lisa and Yanni. Anybody wants to get up with, uh, catch up with Lisa or Yanni, call them and let them know that you want to ride with them. Um, volunteers are needed to carry our banner. I'll need two people for that. Also, I, I thought it would be a great idea and we concluded that we all wear pride colors, the colors of the pride flag for our group, either at the church, in the parade, or down to the festival. Um, our time to get ready will be 11 to 11.30 outside in the church parking lot, and then we'll march down to um, Monument Square to go to our lineup in the parade. This is all available for online participants. If you want to join us, contact the church office, email, text, whatever. The more people, the merrier. Our banner basically says it all, what we can be proud of. And that's what we're going to do next Saturday. So have a good pride. Thank you. John is our pride. We are proud of John and his leadership every, every year that we've had the pride uh, for a while. Thank you. So um, I'm organizing the booth that we're going to have at the festival. I say booth, it's a 
not a booth, but anyway. First of all, we are looking for a pop-up canopy. You know those white little tent things that people have. Um, 10 by 10 or 11 by 11. If anybody has one, please, oh, Liz, thank you. Okay, great, we'll talk. And uh, what we're gonna do at the festival, I just wanna let you know, we're not just gonna have a table. We are going to have um, a prayer booth. We're gonna have uh, special tattoos, uh, you know, non-permanent uh, <laughs> tattoos for the, we're not gonna be tattooing things. Uh, we're gonna have those little temporary tattoos that you stick on for kids or for adults. Um, we're gonna have welcome packets for our church, information about our church. We're going to have kind of a prayer station where people can write prayers on cloth strips. They're going to be hung up uh, as they write them on strings, um, you know, between the tent legs. And then they're going to be made into a quilt by none other than our pastor Reba. He's gonna make them into a quilt and we're gonna raffle off that quilt. So uh, raffle tickets will be available at our table. And we're also going to have people available, like me, Reba, different people available. For anyone who wants to talk, who wants to sit down, maybe tell their story, have a prayer, just have a hug, whatever. You know, um, I don't know if other churches are going to be represented there, but I we're gonna have a strong presence in the park uh, this year. Thank you for everyone who is going to participate. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the other thing that's happening this week for Pride, and I hope that you'll spread the word. It could be that we're advertising to all of the people who say, um, in some ways we need to share this film with folks who might not yet be to the place where they're celebrating Pride. So this is a film, it's called Mama Bears. It's film, it's showing in our chapel Friday night at seven. And it's a documentary that will be aired on PBS in 2023. So this is a screening of it. And it, it's um, based on the lives of four women, two women um, who uh, raised in or belong to a very conservative Christian tradition that really told them that um, to be gay was absolutely a wrong thing. And then they had a child come out. And it's their work to realize that they need to love their child and maybe come to a different understanding of their religion. And then the other two women are two um, lesbian women and maybe their stories um, as well of, of Actually, this part I don't know. I'm making this up. We'll see if I'm right. But there are perhaps interactions with their churches and feeling welcome. So I encourage you, um, especially if you do have people in your lives who just aren't so sure, sure about what the Bible says and what you all are celebrating, um, send them our way. 7 o'clock. It is free. If there's enough interest, uh, we do have the capabilities of showing it online at a later date. So that's this Friday. Please advertise. Um, it's been shared on our church website, or it's on our website. It's on Facebook. If you even just share it to your Facebook page, it's also on Instagram. So if you want to share it that way, that would be wonderful. And one final announcement. You might not know it, but we have um, a gold medalist in our midst. Lucas, would you stand up? If that's all right, if you want to, if you want to, or you can just sit. Lucas was in the Special Olympics, the state games yesterday. Come on forward. I don't have anything for you, Lucas, but come on forward. So this gentleman won gold uh, in the one mile race and in the, 40, the 400 relay and other track and field events. So congratulations. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Friends, may you know that you are a beloved child of God. May you be called into the, the act of repentance 
And may you in the process find deep peace and deeper connection. Go in peace. Amen.